Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chaba Fitzel, and I will talk about how to convince the malware to avoid us. Uh, so who am I? Uh, actually, back to my name, uh, if you work with people with other languages, I learned yesterday that Shaba in Swedish means hi. Uh, and when I work with uh, Spanish people, or s people who talk Spanish, they kept calling me Casaba, and it was really consistent, and at one point, I, okay, I looked it up, and apparently it's a melon uh, in Spanish, or so whatever. Uh, so I, I'm a blue teamer. I'm working for the past five years uh, as part of an incident response team. I do incident response, forensics, malware analysis, basically everything you can imagine and as part of an IR team. Um, I also like, love to do security research. Uh, I have a blog, um, but for the past two years, I don't have too much time to post anything. Uh, but sometimes I, I do. Uh, I'm a certification monkey. I heard this, this term from a trainer called Jeremy Chiora, who does uh, Cisco trainings, and it basically means I love to do certifications for some weird reason. Um, not that it means anything. Uh, I have a wife and an almost four-year-old uh, son. And I love to do hiking, so besides computers, I try to have like a normal life and go outside uh, the house. And actually, this picture made in the Alps uh, last year. So what is this talk about, really? Uh, basically, this sign. Uh, in the real world, if we try to scare away people or keep people away from a certain place, we put signs like, uh, you are not authorized to come in here, or if you come in, you will fall and die, or it's a biohazard, or there is some nuclear radiation. So basically just scare away people that that environment is harmful for them and potentially they can die, and as people don't like to die, uh, they will avoid that place. Uh, I never been at this place, but uh, probably as I love to do hiking, I probably wouldn't care of this sign, but uh, yeah, so my agenda, uh, I will have three main parts. First is, uh, first to overview what Marvel authors are afraid of and what they do to detect it. Uh, then I will review, uh, review a few real-world samples, and the last part I will show my proof-of-concept tools. I will have plenty of demos, uh, all recorded, so sorry for that. Uh, I didn't sacrifice any animals for the demo guts, so I'm going with video. So let's see what Marvel authors are afraid of, security researchers. Uh, so these days, if you are a Marvel analyst, uh, basically, with reverse engineering, you can reveal what the malware does. So you can reveal its operation, then you can write signatures to detect it, either static or behavior. Um, basically, you can uncover everything. And obviously, malware writers doesn't like this. So they try to make the Marvel researchers' life hard. Um, so they do many, many tricks to uh, make it hard to reverse engineer their malware. And as part of it, they know that as it's a long process, you usually do malware research on a virtual machine because that's the simplest. Uh, so they will go, okay, I will detect if I'm running on a virtual machine, I will do something else or sandboxes. So sandboxes are really just automated malware researchers. Um, and if the malware can see that, okay, if I'm running in a sandbox, I will do something else and not do my real uh, job, so the sandbox doesn't detect me. Or it will avoid hardened machines, so if the machine is running 
NAV or something, it will go away. So simply saying malware doesn't like, hates being analyzed. And sometimes it also try to avoid certain targets, like you have a Russian keyboard, okay, I will leave you alone. Um, so how they do it? Uh, this is a huge topic, probably we could spend a week just talking about this, so this is just a very high level overview. Uh, debuggers. So that's one of the favorite. Uh, malware hates being debugged, so people usually doesn't love to be watched by the boss when they work, uh, so it malware. So if it's being debugged, how it, can, how it can detect it? There are plenty of methods. Uh, the most classic one is just simply running the isDebugger present Windows API call, and if you are being debugged, it will say yes. Uh, you can, be, uh, instead of calling the API call, you can just check uh, various flags, like the process environment block is debug flags. Uh, actually, the is debugger present API call will check these flags. Uh, you can check other flags. Uh, you can call the output debug string, uh, which is uh, if you are running inside the debugger, it will run. But if you are not running inside the debugger, then it will throw an error because it cannot produce an output to, any de to a debugger. Uh, so if it doesn't produce an error, it means that you are being debugged. Or you could do timing checks. Uh, like normally if your code run outside of debugger, if you check your code at two points of time, probably a few milliseconds uh, will pass, but that's all. If you are being debugged, then it will be seconds or maybe minutes um, being passed, and you can easily uh, detect them. You can either do it with uh, API calls or use the uh, this read timestamp counter. Uh, this can read out the timestamp counter from the CPU and base the decision it uh, based on that. You can try to self debug yourself. So you can say, okay, I will start debugging myself, but if there is a debugger already attached to you, you cannot attach another one. Uh, you can search for in tree instruction in your memory. Uh, in tree is the it's an SMD instruction that the debuggers will place in the code uh, to mark breakpoints. So malware can scan the memory for these, and if it's detected, then it knows that uh, it's running in debugger. Or just actual window name, like is there an only debug window running? And there are other methods. Uh, virtual machines, you can look for registry items, file system artifacts, process names. Like if you install VMware tools uh, in a virtual machine, it will, trace, it will leave traces in the registry, file system, processes, everywhere. You can check the MAC address uh, of the virtual machine. Uh, VMware has a special IO port that you can detect. Uh, there is a, another technique called the red pill. It's basically an instruction to read the address. Well, there are many variations of this, but it, it will read the address of the global descriptor table uh, register or the local descriptor table, so whatever these memory registers. Uh, and it will be different if you are running inside the VM uh, because you have one global descriptor table per CPU and if you have a virtual machine, then you have another CPU uh, on the same physical hardware, so it will have some different value. Uh, these days, it might not so reliable since um, we have many cores uh, in a computer, uh, but it might still work. And if I go back, so like if you analyze samples in sandbox like Cuckoo or hybrid analysis uh, on the web, they will have like signatures telling you that this malware is trying to detect if it's running in a VM. And there are many of those, so it's not like a unique uh, item. Sandboxes, uh, 
This is a huge topic. I really recommend everyone to watch uh, Zoltan Balash talk about the sandbox detection for the masses. Uh, he made a study about how these sandboxes look. And it's very interesting because if you are a sandbox, let's say malware can check the screen resolution, and many times the sandbox will have like 800 times 600 pixel resolution. Come on, these days, which computer has an 800 times 600? Probably if it has, you can just leave it alone because it's sold. Um, but so generally, sandboxes will have a much smaller resolution. So if you are setting yourself a cuckoo, make it like a, look like a real computer, like make it full HD or, or something. Uh, the number of installed software. So if you use your computer, you will have probably like 50 different software installed on it. Uh, if you have a sandbox, you will probably install like Office, Acrobat, Java, Flash, um, Chrome, Firefox, and it, probably that's it. Uh, so if you are enumerating the installed software, it can give you a sense if you are running in a sandbox or not. Um, number of course, uh, because having multiple VMs uh, is resource intensive, so people will limit the number of cores uh, in the VM. Now, these days, I think for, like, for the past 10 years, you cannot really buy a computer without uh, at least two cores. Um, so if you have a one core computer detected, then it will mean probably it's a sandbox. Memory, I think these days it's at least four gigabytes. Uh, sandboxes, we run like on half gig, gig, maybe two gig, but um, typically not that more. Desktop, uh, anyone ever set up a Cuckoo VM here? So the below picture is like typically how you leave it. I did set up many VMs for Cuckoo, and when you install the base software with like XP, this is how your desktop will look like probably, and this is how most people just leave it. Now a real desktop will have like plenty of icons on the taskbar, maybe plenty of files on the desktop. Uh, users will have running application, maybe games like um, the screenshot above and it will just look different. Uh, antivirus, again, malware might be afraid of certain products, so it can just check if an antivirus is registered or not. Um, it can check the registry file system, whatever, the same story. So let's see a couple of free word malware samples. Uh, do you remember WannaCry? Uh, it was pretty recent, and uh, it had a technique um, inside to detect sandbox. So it looked up a random but hard-coded domain, and if it could resolve and access it, uh, it said, okay, I'm running in a sandbox, so I will exit. Um, this is a good detection because sandboxes will res resolve every domain, um, most likely, but they actually screw it up because uh, a British guy, the Marvel Tech, the guy behind the Marvel Tech blog, registered the domain and basically, essentially, he killed uh, the first version of the Marvel, uh, like any, any, any new, new uh, run. Uh, this is uh, another example. It's a word dropper, and it's also set for uh, sandbox detection. And actually, I can quickly show this. So this was a word dropper with a macro, and you can just open the document, so you can use tools to like extract the macro, uh, or you can just not start the macro and then review it. And although the macro is really obfuscated, is it seen? Uh, yeah, probably the resolution here is not 
the best. But the point is that uh, this dropper will check uh, for the, num the number of recent files opened with uh, Microsoft Word. And if it's below three, it will say, okay, I'm running in a sandbox. And what it will do is basically error out after it. Uh, because in a sandbox, you probably don't have any recent files, or maybe one. Uh, but in like a real life computer, probably you have like 20 or eight. Not sure if there is any uh, limit. So this one is another uh, example. This is a generic Trojan. Uh, it will check for. Mm. No, it's in. Mm. Let's try to. Okay, plug and unplug works. Um, so this is another example. This is a, it's a generic Trojan. And if you run it, it will check for a whole lot of stuff, um, like a lot of analysis tool, um, like Windows sniffer, uh, virtual, uh, virtual book guest editions, uh, sandbox C, another sandbox, uh, .NET profiler, and, and all sort of stuff. Sigwin, and yeah, Wireshark, it's also there. Uh, I will not go through the video due to the resolution. Uh, but again, these are real world samples that are checking stuff. Um, this is another one. Uh, it's a Tesla, Tesla uh, crypt sample. Uh, actually, you can take the hash and uh, analyze it yourself. Uh, this is why I put it, it in the title. And it will go for antivirus detection. And it will actually detect the existence of uh, ESET. So I'm not sure if we have one, anyone here from ESET, but basically your existence already preventing the malware from running. And I actually want to show this. So I will not switch. Uh, so if we run Tesla script, so the ESET registry entry is not there. And if we just start uh, the malware to run. Uh, it takes some time initially, so you can see the, the, here's the malware in the process tree. Um, it takes a few seconds initially to actually start operating, so you can see it starts to migrate itself, and essentially it started another uh, process here. And the Tesla script main sample had like well, you need to believe me, it's 4,200 events uh, done. And actually, it's, it checked for the existence of the ESET uh, product, and it didn't found it. So what's the difference if I place the ESET string, um, key in the registry in the right place? the malware will behave uh, differently. So let me again, a little bit fast forward this one. So it had like 600 events uh, when it exited. 
the process is not there anymore. Uh, it's not running. It didn't create any new process like in the previous case. Um, and, and basically that's it. And if we check, when it tried to look up the ESET config, it was a success. So it found ESET on the computer. Well, it wasn't actually installed, but um, we kind of show that it, it's there. And so the, the malware escaped. So, and actually this is the point where I'm uh, going with. Uh, you can scare away malware. But today's research, so what's in the focus really uh, about this topic when malware tries to find VM artifacts, debuggers, uh, it's actually mainly about hiding all these tools because people try to do malware research and they want to hide their debugger or they want to hide uh, their VM. And like Oli Debugger has like uh, plugins that has like 20, 30 tricks <laughs> that can hide debugger and um, many things from, from a malware. Or like uh, ZeroFox is a plugin for Cuckoo Sandbox, which will hide that it's a virtual machine. Uh, so the main focus really today is, uh, is the malware researcher job? Uh, there is also another tool called the Paranoid Fish, the PA Fish, which will verify the environment for you. So it will check plenty of stuff in the environment and tell if it detected that it's a sandbox or not. Uh, but what about vaccination? So this is the term people start to use for the other side when we want to scare away malware. Uh, when we try to emulate an unhealthy environment for it, it's not that much research. Uh, but actually it would be effective as we saw with, uh, with, with WannaCry or with TeslaCrypt uh, or, or with other malware. So there is some research on this area, but not that much. So like these three items that I listed here, uh, the things I found on this, this topic. So there was a white paper initially back in 2008. Um, then like five year quiet period, or at least I didn't found anything. Then Rapid7 had a blog post about uh, vaccination in 2013. Then I didn't list it myself. I started to research this in 2015 and I blogged about it. And then just like two months ago, I found out that there was a, another talk in besides Tel Aviv uh, from Gar Bitensky about this topic. Uh, actually, he works for Minerva Labs that I will talk about uh, later. And these days, we have a few tools that target specific malware to scare away, but there are no generic tools uh, to do it. So this is my contribution to this uh, topic. I started to create some proof of concept tools uh, to this to show malware some unhealthy environment. Uh, and I started to experiment uh, how we can do this. Uh, I'm not a developer. Uh, when I learned in the university, I learned coding. And at one point, I actually wanted to be a programmer. But by the end of the university, I decided not um, so I, as usually I don't write code, this is my development method. And I think many of us uh, do this. Um, copy and paste from Stack Overflow or, or from the internet. Um, so I did change codes, but um, I utilize other sources uh, to do. So the, my first tool is the fake VM. And that's a kernel driver that uses SSDT hooking uh, to hook a couple of functions and to produce uh, different results. So as it's using SSDT hooking, uh, it's up to Windows 7 32-bit. Uh, actually, when I wrote this tool, my original intention was to 
learn how to do SSDT hooking in, in a C uh, language. And I use this example to, uh, to do things. Uh, it can emulate VirtualBox and VMware files and uh, registry entries. Uh, it's very easy to extend to anything else, so like you can add like the ESET or other antivirus registry keys to the tool. Uh, it's just like another if statement uh, or whatever. And you can also control this tool uh, externally and switch on, uh, switch up certain uh, items. So, where is my mouse? So just to show you, before I load uh, fake VM, I run the PA fish tool, what I mentioned before, uh, what it can detect uh, from the environment. Now, I'm using virtual machine, uh, especially that I have a Mac and this is Windows. Uh, so the PA fish will detect some items. Uh, I didn't hide like the Mac address and everything, but so there is a huge section for uh, VirtualBox, which is here, so it didn't detect anything about uh, VirtualBox. Uh, for VMware, um, it detected one file, not the registry entry, and the yeah, serial number and MAC address. So, so PAFish does see that it's a VM, but not through the items that I want to uh, falsify or lie about. Okay, so let's see the two. So fake VM, this is a kernel driver. So the way you load it, you need to create a service. Uh, you can use the built-in commands, the SC uh, create, uh, and you can create a kernel driver service. Um, or you have the OSR loader tool that can load uh, the file for you. Essentially, it will do the same. Uh, but then you don't need another tool uh, this way. So you just register your sysfi or driver and you start it. And it's running. And let's start PAFish uh, again. So what it says uh, this time. Actually, let me do it. This way, sorry. Um, so you can see that it can see virtual box through many, many registry entries. Uh, it will detect that there are virtual box files uh, on the system, although there aren't any, uh, actually. And it can also detect VMware tools in the registry. Now, I didn't install VMware tools uh, on this computer and it also detected other files. Uh, now I wrote a small uh, controller for this tool uh, to be able to switch on, switch off uh, certain items, because let's say you have a malware and if they start to realize that, okay, you can like uh, falsify VMware or VirtualBox, then okay, if you have both, then that's probably not true. So someone is trying to like uh, lie to us and you can control if you only want to falsify only VMware or just VirtualBox. So if I switch off VirtualBox, as you can see, it's not detected anymore, uh, but VMware is still detected. Uh, so this controlling is done through IOCTR codes, uh, talking to the kernel driver. Um, this can be done from user mode, so that's not a, a hard thing to do. Now I switched, uh, I, I actually unhooked uh, all the functions, so it's basically back to like a normal state. And now we can see that it doesn't detect either VirtualBox or VMware through the uh, 
other methods, and then I can just switch back uh, everything, like hook again, all the functions, and I can just uh, switch on, uh, switch off VMware, and then switch on like VirtualBox as I want. Um, even this controlling part can be easily extended, and it's like if as statement and having a variable to track uh, the status. Uh, so as you can see, VMware is not detected through registry now, but VHRbox uh, is detected. Uh, so the other one, the other tool is the fake debugger windows. Um, so many times malware will check for the presence of debuggers or security tools as we saw before. Uh, so this is a simple Windows application that will create a window for you, naming it Oli Debug or and Win Debug, and hide it so you don't have like a disturbing uh, window. Now I actually looked up a sample Windows application on Microsoft website. I copy pasted it. I changed the window title, and that's it. And I there is an option to show the window, and I took it out so it's it remains hidden. And essentially, that's um, very simple. And I wrote a, another tool to actually find these windows. So you can enumerate windows. And you can see that only window is not found, and WinDebug uh, window is not found. I can start the real WinDebug. I run again the application, and it will say, OK, WinDebug uh, window is uh, found. Uh, I close it, run it again, and again, no, none of the windows is found. Now I can run my homemade application, and basically it will create a, a, an Oli debugger and a WinDebug window. I run again the same application, it will tell, OK, I found Oli debug and WinDebug. Um, again, this is again a very simple and easy way to lie about things. You can see that the process is running. It's consuming like half meg of memory, so it's really nothing. And you can actually scare away malware with this. And the thing I wasn't sure if I have a name in a window and I want them to use WinDebug with the same name, if it creates any conflicts, um, but not. It wasn't obvious to me. Um, and then if I just end the process um, and run again, again, these windows are not uh, found. Uh, the last tool, uh, I called it the mutex grabber. So mutexes are, or mutants are other items which uh, used by malware uh, to check uh, in the system because the malware will say, okay, if I infected this computer once, I don't want to infect it again. Like, it, for like ransomware, if it encrypted the files once, it doesn't want to encrypt them again. Uh, so it will create a mutex or mutant in the, uh, on Windows and check if it's already there or not. Now, you can just create these or tell the processes, okay, every mutex that you are checking uh, is existing on the system, so you can probably achieve it with hooking, or you can just statically create these mutants. So what's the best source um, to get these unique mutant names that malware will try to check? Um, malware analysis outputs, and you can go for malware.com, and that's a cuckoo sandbox, and it will produce an output these are the mutants that the malware was trying to check. Uh, so my tool, uh, it's written in Python, uh, and it will periodically fetch malware.com for any, any new analysis and add those new, new mutants uh, to the system. Now, you can do some whitelisting because there are legit uh, mutants that you don't want to create because they might conflict with other application. And you can also save and load uh, mutants to the tool. 
Um, so let's see how it works. Uh, first, let me just show you uh, WannaCry. Uh, yeah, the resolution is not the best. I'm not sure if it will be seen, but uh, so when WannaCry was started to spread, uh, I run this tool and it took like a couple of seconds to actually find that mutant on, uh, on malware.com because people were, were actively submitting uh, samples to it. So this is the tool listing all the mutants uh, it found and uh, created. And if you look then so yeah, it's not seen very well, but these are the two mutants that WannaCry used uh, on the system. So again, as people submit this stuff, uh, you can uh, it's it's like a signature update uh, for you. So what the tool can do, essentially. Uh, Again, it's written in Python. Probably coding the GUI part to it was the, the hardest part. Um, so it will fetch malware.com. It will start to load uh, and create uh, mutants. You can also monitor that uh, in a process explorer uh, on the right that all these mutants are actually created. Uh, and you can delete these mutants, so there is an active uh, column that you can check or uncheck if you want to create it or not. By default, it will create it. You can whitelist a mutant, because maybe it's a legit one, and if you whitelisted it, you cannot uh, enable it again, unless you unwhitelist it. And you can load the whitelist, you can load mutants you saved, you can save uh, your whitelist, your uh, simply the mutant list. You can do whatever you want. And just to show that it can be effective against WannaCry. So what happens if you just run WannaCry? Uh, I will just forward it, and basically you can see that WannaCry started to encrypt all the files, and you have a couple of thousands of events, or tens of thousands of events with uh, accessing uh, and writing to all of the files. Uh, so you can see that it's, it's definitely running. Uh, but what happens if, if I start this tool and, and then start WannaCry, and there is a slight cheating here, uh, what I will mention after. So I just loaded the WannaCry mutants from a file uh, to the tool. So it created them on Windows, and then I will just start uh, the WannaCry executable. And it stopped at about 1,700 events. And if I scroll down, uh, it's exited. So the process terminated, and, and that's all. Compared to the previous event, when it started to encrypt everything. Now, it's effective, as we can see, but the, the cheating here was that uh, WannaCry spread through some SMB exploit, and uh, when it exploited SMB remotely, it was running in session zero, while your user session is session one. And if you create the mutex in session one, that's not seen in session zero. So essentially just creating the mutant in session one uh, wouldn't save you from WannaCry specifically. Uh, but in this case, as I started WannaCry in the same user session, it prevented it. Uh, many more were I would say most malware will not spread through remote kernel exploits, so essentially it will run in the same user session where you are. 
uh, so this can be still effective. And yeah, so again, there is some good results here that you can actually scare away malware uh, with such tools, but again, it's not that much research. And there are challenges, I think, in this area. So first is software compatibility. So let's say I want to lie about debuggers. I want to tell every application that, yes, you are being debugged. Does it cause any issues with legit real-world application? Do normal software care about virtual machine? Probably not virtual machine, but uh, debuggers. Um, depends on the method you use. You can consume lots of system resources. So like creating mutants, if it's a couple of hundred, uh, then it's good. But if you start to create like tens of thousands mutants on a system, you can take up resources. Uh, one way to do it is like with hooking, like the first tool, where I didn't create any registry or files on the system. I just hooked functions and when it was searching for VMware, I just returned the value that yes, found. Um, or you can do user level hooking to um, lie about mutants. Uh, again, what about low level vaccination like the, the red pill uh, items when malware will check the global descriptor table or uh, other things? Uh, the other thing is that you need to do it in, in a clever way. So you cannot just tell them over, there is everything on this system. Because if there is everything, that will be suspicious. Again, if you say that I have VMware and VirtualBox in this machine, then that's probably not true. So that's not realistic. So you will have either VMware or VirtualBox. So you need to pick up one of them. Or Malware will check for antivirus software. You cannot tell that I have 10 antivirus software running on this computer because, again, that's not true and probably that wouldn't work. Uh, so you need to pick it up in a, in a good way and just say, okay, I have this antivirus product. Uh, and it can be dynamic, so maybe the malware will try to check for 10 and you can lie about the first one. Uh, but it's a, it's a challenge. Now, are there any like production grade solution for this? Uh, because as I mentioned, this is not an area that's so widely researched. Uh, and this is not an advertisement here. It just, um, I try to find tools which uh, actually try to use this. And my first found was the Hitman Pro Alert tool, which has a vaccination uh, feature and it can do some vaccination. I, I don't know how they do it. Uh, since it says active vaccination and not passive, I suppose they hook something or do something like that. Uh, and actually this tool has many other interesting ideas for protecting uh, the computer. But actually this was the first tool uh, I found probably two years ago that they did some, some vaccination. And if it, I checked it with PA fish, uh, the paranoid fish, mm. uh, what is seen actually? So what uh, what this tool will do? Uh, so first, if it's disabled, and if I just run PA fish uh, on the computer, again, this will be a virtual machine, so it will do find items, but not everything. So nothing about VirtualBox and four items about VMware. Now, if we go and enable uh, vaccination with uh, Hitman Pro, uh, let's see what changes. Ignore the first part. So VirtualBox, there is one item detected um, and there are one more item detected for VMware. So it's instead of four, there, is, there are five. Um, 
So it actually does say that you have VirtualBox and VMware on this computer. So if this area would become more common, the research and malware would say that, okay, if you have both, then okay, I will not believe you. Uh, this again might be a problem, but um, it's still a good, we are not there yet where malware will think it's suspicious. So I think it's a good step uh, ahead. And the other tool I found is uh, Minerva Labs. I don't really know too much about them, but they, they have a software dedicated for this only. Uh, I never use it, I don't know what it's uh, capable, but it's, it's promising. So they actually dedicated um, this uh, for vaccination. Um, as I know, they work for a couple of years uh, on this. And, and they have some good blog and research about this topic. And, and you can see that you can actually fight malware uh, with, with vaccinating a, a computer. Uh, conclusion, I do think it's an interesting area, which for some reason not being picked up uh, by the security community. Uh, it is effective against malware. It's not effective against every malware, but if, you, if we can stop a certain percentage, it's, it's already good. Uh, we cannot shoot for everything. Um, I think it should be more commonly researched, um, and I think it can have, well, not just two long-term effects, it can be more, but, um, well, if this method would become really popular and, and people and other, like, security products will start to deploy these kind of techniques, Marvel might just say, okay, I will not stop caring about virtual machines and that would be good because then it would ease the malware researcher jobs because they don't, wouldn't have to deal with uh, lying or hiding VMs, debuggers. Or everything stays, and which is good then because we can protect against malware. Or we can end up somewhere in between. Uh, or as it's a cat and mouse game, uh, both sides will evolve and um, be, both sides will, will progress, and uh, if we do vaccination, then malware researcher will, okay, I will check a combination of items and make a conclusion based on that, and then we need to be more clever on the vaccination side. So, yeah, we will see, but we are not there yet. So that was all from me. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, and all these tools I show, it's uh, on GitHub. Uh, that's the link. So thank you. Thanks for a great talk, Tavo. Um, do we have any questions in the crowd? Oh, lots of questions. Let's start over here. A good talk. I just want to ask a simple and short question. Uh, so would you say the ultimate end game to fight the detection of uh, virtual boxes is moving one step ahead by setting every flag to true with having multiple recent files and both VMware and VirtualBox and so on to preemptively counter the cat and mouse game. Uh, so I didn't get it. So, so um, you said to prevent malware from detecting uh, or tricking the malware, you would say yeah. that you had a VirtualBox when you didn't. Yes. So one step ahead, would that be saying that you have everything in a virtual box to take one step ahead of the malware? Yes, so, <laughs> yeah, so there are plenty of stuff we can, we can lie about. Uh, I, I'm always thinking about how we can maybe even lie about sandboxes, lie about maybe resolution or, or like recent files and, and this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure how that could be done. That's maybe another area that where the compatibility issues would um, come up because other software might like query like the resolution uh, of the computer and adjust the, the window or, the, or their, their own resolution based on that. So that might conflict. So I'm, I, I don't know the answer, um, but maybe other more clever people can find this out, but yeah. 
Okay. All right, let's see right here. Hi, uh, I, I have a question for someone, from someone watching the live stream who wonders if it isn't possible that uh, a follow-up reaction from the malware or the attacker could be to uh, try to break the system instead of, of just, you know, quitting itself. So, yeah, so I think if, if we start to do this, malware will try again to go ahead and then we will go ahead and this will be like um, an endless game, uh, just like everything else. But, but I don't know where it would end, uh, if it ever. But yeah, so if, if we would start using such tool in a popular, like, broad way, malware will definitely evolve and might come with, with other new tricks uh, to find this. Thank you. All right, let's keep moving on. Hi. Uh, so speaking of compatibility issues, uh, one of the, I think, most interesting parts would be downloading a lot of malware and trying to find the most uh, op optimal combination of which keys are common malware looking for uh, to find a, a way, easy way to create registry issues or examples just to stop malware. Do you know if anybody has done any research on that or started playing around with that? Um, yes, that's right. So that would be a good... Uh, approach. Uh, I really don't know if anyone really researched it. I think the Minerva Labs, Labs guys are the one who extensively researched this topic because they came up with a dedicated uh, tool for this. Um, but again, since they have like a, an enterprise great product, they will not tell anything how they work or, or what they do. So I don't know. But as like open source community or other researchers, uh, I don't find. Again, those four items I show, those are the, were the public research I found on this topic. All right, let's see, we have one more question here. I think that's gonna have to be the last one, unfortunately. Yeah, so my, my question is, is more uh, towards the, uh, the, the use of this, and I, I was thinking about sandboxes. Uh, one of the purposes is to uh, use heuristics to identify suspicious behavior of, uh, of samples. Um, so why not just look at um, samples that check for, uh, am I running in a virtual environment? Are there AVs installed and so on? And just quarantine them um, and be done with it. Now that wouldn't help you analyzing the malware, but it would at least stop them at the border. Um, yes, I, I agree. So that would be a step where like sandboxes uh, could evolve and put this logic um, into, the, into the system. But so I think as we saw many, many of the sandboxes like uh, I know like Cuckoo for sure and uh, there is the, the, um, the hybrid analysis. I think that's the um, payload security, it's behind that uh, site. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, they also have like signatures saying that this malware tried to detect uh, VMware and that's suspicious. So they have a scoring uh, for that. And I think if something is checking for, uh, for like a VMware or like an antivirus that will raise the score. Um. Oh, thanks. Yeah. All right, uh, that's all the time we have for questions right now, but you will be available to answer more, I'm sure, during lunch and dinner. Um, so please join me once more in thanking Chaba Fetzel for this great talk. Thank you.